Good afternoon. I'm Francis Levy. Ed Recession and I are co-directors of the Philip Teddy Center. And welcome to Recovering Syntax, a poet's struggle with aphasia. But before we deal with aphasia, I'm just shocked to learn from my friend Mike Brazilla here that there was a, a uh, I shouldn't make light of this, but I, I, have, I love this diner on, I love diners. And there's this diner on 14th Street called the Good Stuff. Do you know what you're down at the New School? Uh, the Good Stuff Diner on oh, 14th. Sure. There was yeah. a murder there this morning. Yeah. Really? And I hesitate to turn everything into a sense of humor, but when you find comfort somewhere and then learn that the comfort has been is, is disparaged, you get concerned. <laughs> and this may be the making of some form of <laughs> sublimation, some sort of poetic yes. activity on my part, at least. Uh, right. Before we begin this afternoon's event, uh, I wanted to make an announcement about some other upcoming events. First of all, Look around at the walls, and you will see the exhibit from our uh, from WPA to the NEA roundtable. All Phil and Tatey's roundtables and art exhibits are kind of coeval, and we don't have an art exhibit for this particular event. But we will, we will choose certain events that inspire art exhibits, and this one is particularly interesting. There's Beatrice Coron's work, and. Hallie, you just came in, so could you say a word about Eric Lindvelt? Because this work is extremely interesting that's on the wall here. Hallie curates the shows. It's a um, work that he uh, has constructed that's made out of old paper and sawdust and uh, pencil and paint. So it's an all, all of a, it's all fabricated, so it looks very much very naturalistically uh, like the specimens that he collects and gathers uh, throughout the New York area. He was awarded a, some public funding for his work. So the show basically is about public art and the funding, uh, public funding of art, which we consider <coughs> crucial in our today. So uh, some things you may have seen in some ways. Uh, Peter Sis. Peter Sis, great illustrator and Arthur Fellow. Uh, Winters has her uh, subway there, those cut out things you see in the subway about New York. So it's a very um, much what you see in in the public eye. And our Janine Menloves, the reproductions of Janine Menloves' amazing uh, poster designs inspired by the WPA type art, are they still available? We still have a couple of those available for sale at $10 each. Uh, so if you're interested in that artwork, uh, see Holly afterwards. Uh, other up and coming events are on the, on the 29th, the, American Academy, the Academy of American Poets is having two events here that we're co authoring with them. One is on emerging poets, and Megan uh, O'Rourke is on that panel, along with other. I wouldn't exactly call her emerging, but she's on the panel. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then after that, very excitingly, at 3 30, um, Ann Carson is giving the Blaney lecture, and she had this idea of showing the movie Contempt afterwards. I just have to say this, because we're not doing it. Uh, <laughs> but the movie Contempt is so per would have been a perfect suggestion, because those of you who have followed her work, she's interested in both new wave cinema, and lot. obviously she's a professor of classics, and, and, and Contempt is the perfect amalgamation of those two ideas, and I really... So if, if you come to the lecture, just think you might have been seeing the film. <laughs> so, uh, following the, that same weekend, we have the Imagine nation of Hamlet on October 30th, and Robert Brewstein, the former head of the American Rep at Harvard, will be here, along with the actor Christian Camargo and Eugene Mahan, the uh, psychoanalyst, and Paul Fry from Yale, uh, Shakespearean scholar, will be uh, moderating that panel. On November 6th, we are very excited about this. No, I'm very excited, I have to say, about our Vertigo roundtable, Finding Equilibrium in Vertigo. And uh, it's one of my favorite movies, and it's an amazing panel, and... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, uh, I hope you can all make it to that. And then on November, uh, and then November 11th, Mike Brazil will be doing a Our Life in Poetry on another one of my favorite, it, it, sort of, how can I put this, poets, but more than that, Frank O'Hara with Mark Doty and David Lehman. Uh, David Lehman has also been at Philip Tades on several occasions. And then on November 14th, we have Stephanie Chase continuing her music series um, from... Muse to Music, Exploring the Craft of the American Art Song. So all those are up-and-coming events. And all Philoctetes events, if you go to www.philoctetes.org, you can see all our events simulcast. Like if you happen to be home, you can see it 
on your computer. You can go to our archive by going to past programming and see it, or you can go to our YouTube channel and see it. And, and YouTube, we get, we get real, literally hundreds of thousands of hits for Philoctetes programming. So if you happen to be on a Philoctetes panel and there's no audience here, don't worry. There's, <laughs> that's not the case today, but you're, you're immortalized. Uh, I'm now pleased to present Jackson Taylor. Jackson Taylor helped found the graduate writing program at the New School, where he continues to teach. For almost 20 years, he has served as director of the prison writing program at the Penn American Center, and he wrote the program's handbook for writers in prison. Taylor also teaches creative writing at Media Bistro and the Holy Apostles Soup Kitchen. His novel, The Blue Orchard, was published by Simon & Schuster in 2010. Jackson Taylor will moderate this afternoon's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. So, Jackson, take it away. And Thank you, I will move this from I, I want to say before I introduce the guest that I'm very much a lay person in the conversation of aphasia. And I'm hoping that in this discussion, and possibly in this room, there will be people who have perhaps um, experienced um, the symptoms of aphasia themselves. There might also be professionals who have worked in that field. And uh, there might also be writers, because this panel is particularly focused on writers and aphasia. And there might be people who are, who are like myself, new to the conversation and interested in, in seeing aspects of the treatment of, of that malady. Um, the guests we have today, I'm going to ask them to speak a couple of sentences when we, in a moment about why they're here today, what, what their particular fields of interest. But we have Jason W. Brown, and he is a clinical professor of neurology at the New York University Medical Center. And he's author of many books, and I'll let you talk about yourself in just a moment. And we also have uh, Dorothy Ross. And Dorothy is a clinical specialist in speech language pathology, pathology at the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And then finally, we have Marie Ponceau, renowned poet, and I must admit, a, a personal friend of mine. And I am particularly happy to be here today because um, Marie's friendship is a very important part of my life, but also because I saw her within the first day if not the first day, I don't even remember. I think I, I got a call from one of your children and saw you right away. And then I saw you at least once a week throughout the summer while you were uh, recovering. And to see the phases that you went through were just absolutely fascinating. And um, so I'm happy to talk about that. And you had always very interesting things to say along the way about what, you know. <laughs> so I'm hoping to get to some of those things. Before we... we um, go further the conversation, I just wanted to read a couple of things. I, as a layperson, thought it would be useful to maybe just give a sense for people uh, who don't know aphasia that well what the range of the symptoms are. And they, you're, I have a little bit of a, ta a tabulated list here, and I'll just read a few of them. I'm not going to go into details with them. But the inability to comprehend language is the first um, thing on the list. Then it goes uh, varying degrees of symptoms broken off of that, the inability to pronounce. And it's not due to muscle paralysis or weakness. Um, there can be the inability to speak spontaneously. There can be the inability to form actual words. There can be the inability to name objects. There can be poor enunciation. Um, there could be excessive creation and use of personal neologisms. There can be the inability to repeat a phrase. There can be persistent repetition of phrases. Um, anyway, that just sort of gives you an idea. And then we move to like inability to read, inability to write, limited verbal output, and difficulty naming things that had previously been very familiar. So that just sort of gives you a, a sense of the range of what, um, what we're talking about today. Um, Jason, would you go first and introduce yourself and talk about what your work is well, or has been? Uh, I started out 
studying aphasia, really, uh, for 10 or 15 years uh, in Boston, which was a primary training ground for people in, I'm a neurologist, but people interested in behavior and cognition language. And uh, aphasia was really, you could say, the royal path into the mind, because uh, aphasia, you could localize different kinds of aphasias. Yes. And uh, if, you couldn't, if you couldn't work with language in the brain, you, you probably couldn't work with anything else, at least not at that time, because we didn't have the imaging techniques that we have now. Uh, so uh, I, I worked for 10 or 12 or something years, and then branched into neuropsychology. In the last 10 or 15 years, I've been more interested in uh, an occupational hazard of neurologists as they get older is that they become philosophical, so uh, <laughs> uh, become more interested in uh, process philosophy and the problems of time and change and uh, things of that sort, subjectivity. Uh, let me just say that, broadly speaking, aphasias are divided into two major types, the motor type or frontal base type and the posterior type, sensory aphasia, or we speak of non-fluent for the anteriors and fluent for the posteriors. Now, I think that the aphasia that our guest has dealt with was a fluent aphasia from what she describes. And those are the kinds of aphasias that you can get some very interesting, to me as a neurologist, excuse me, maybe not to you, but phenomena, phenomena that occur during uh, attempts to speak or um, at different stages in recovery. And I can discuss that more if you'd like. Uh, the motor aphasics really have trouble speaking, producing phrases, as they're often left with residual utterances. Uh, in American literature, it's usually some obscenity. Uh, in the French literature, it can be quite uh, florid and flamboyant. For example, uh, a French aphasic who's a member of the Academy, his name was never revealed, but he was a very distinguished writer who had an aphasia who couldn't speak. All he was left with was a phrase, bonsoir les choses d'ici bas, farewell things of this world. And that's all he could say, and he said it over and over and over again. While a, an example of an American aphasic might be someone like uh, uh, President Kennedy's father, who was left with the word shit, and that's all he could say. And, but he was able to inflect it. So he, if he wanted to say, uh, he, so, tell somebody to come over, he would go, shit, shit. Or shit, it means go away. Um, uh, Baudelaire had an aphasia uh, from a syphilitic stroke. And he was left with the word short, which is part of the, uh, excuse me, uh, that's somebody. Uh, he was left with the word crenom, which is part of sacre nom de Dieu, uh, which is a French oath. And he could also inflect it. Uh, the, the chort is a word, I think, meaning devil, and it's part of go to the devil, and that was Lenin's residual utterance. So you, there are many examples of this in the literature. Uh, the fluent aphasics, however, can have phonological problems, uh, they can have semantic or lexical problems, or they can have a combination of the two. Now, it sounds to me that we were dealing initially here with a combination of the two, so that we're ne neologisms, nonsense words. And we were discussing a good example of that was, is, twas brillig and the slithy toves is a very good example of neologistic jargon. And I sometimes use that in teaching because it's a, it shows how you can have a very totally nonsensical utterances, but there's a, a preservation of the syntax. And the cadence and the rhythm. And the well, cadence, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you have neologism, generally there's no recognition of error. Uh, by the patient. When you have uh, phonological errors, they do recognize the, that they're having problems and try to correct themselves. When they're largely semantic errors, that is word substitutions, they often are not aware that they're producing... Um, well, okay, here's an example of... Uh, an example of semantic jargon would be Chomsky's phrase, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Now, that's semantic jargon, because every word contradicts the preceding word. Colorless green, you can't have colors in green. Green ideas, ideas aren't green, and so on. So the sentence doesn't make any sense, but it's grammatical. And he went on to make a whole case about that. Uh, but that would be a case of semantic jargon. And patients who would speak like that would not ordinarily be aware that they were talking, uh, not, I, I don't want to say nonsensically, but that people really couldn't understand what they were saying. Those are the two really broad categories of aphasia. And what's, 
I, I, you can stop me when I'm going on too, too long, but uh, uh, I, I was saying that there was a conference in London, uh, I think in the 50s or 60s, a symposium in which they gathered together among the most eminent neurologists, linguists, uh, psychologists who were working in this field. And one of the questions that was asked was, uh, you know, what happens to a writer or a poet when they become aphasic? And there were no examples. Nobody could think of any. There are cases on record of painters or musicians that we could discuss if you'd like. Uh, they're very interesting cases of what happens after that. But with an aphasia, it was assumed that you would just be de devastated. Uh, now, there's also an interesting literature on... And the examples, the historical examples you gave, Baudelaire and so forth, those, those writers stopped working? Excuse me? Those writers stopped working or there, there was... Oh, yeah, there was... There's a, yeah, that, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, even, even, I would say, it was another topic that's a little uh, tangential, but even blindness. Uh, Borges, when he became blind, wrote very little after that. Uh, uh, you know, Milton, when he wrote Paradise Lost, uh, it said that he would spend the whole day composing one stanza in his head and then dictate it in the evening. Is, so the feedback and the revision and all of that is so important. If you, just blindness could be very debilitating, I would think. But um, what's been studied more is what's called schizophagia, that is, aphasic-like utterances in um, schizophrenics, very deeply regressed schizophrenics. We don't tend to see patients like that so much anymore. Or uh, poetic-like productions during sleep, I mean, the, or during trance states. A classic example, of course, is Coleridge's Kubla Khan, but there are many other examples of, uh, of writing actually brilliant poetry during sleep or transitional state or probably, I don't think, maybe during dream too, I don't know. It's not clear whether it occurs during dream or deep sleep. Uh, so I think that would be the that would be the kind of scope of of what I would love to discuss here, okay, and, and I'll stop now and I'll let somebody else. To. Thank you. And, and Dorothy, how about you? What, when you heard about this panel today, what appealed to you about it, and what is your work about uh, to introduce yourself? Well, to? I'm a speech language pathologist, and I, my job involves treating many kinds of patients, but I have a special interest in aphasia, so. Uh, for the last eight years, I volunteered with aphasia groups, which is how I met Marie. And uh, initially, my interest was what does, how does the brain work, and how does this reflect in language? But as I worked with people in the group, I got more interested in the recovery process and what happened. All right, after one person described um, a stroke as a shipwreck. One minute you're sailing along smoothly, and the next you're grounded, broken apart, and then, all right, now what? So I've been very interested in that process of, okay, there's re rehabilitation which addresses the specific um, difficulties you might have now after the stroke, but then what do you do to move on with life? What, what makes a recovery successful? So that's what I've been thinking a lot about in the last eight years. I'm sure we do. And Marie, would you talk a little bit? I mean, you're our guest who has actually gone through <laughs> the tunnel of this experience. It's a big joke, really. It's a, um, it's a sense having talked all your life and as a teacher been at particular attention to listening, to discovering that you can't listen at all with any patience at all. When you have a stroke, your brain is stricken, and it is trying in some mysterious way to do all kinds of things that are making you better, but it's busy. It doesn't want to hear anything. The desire for input that has been avid for all my life was closed off. I looked at the computer and I twisted it around so I couldn't look at its screen. I don't tell me any more, right? It happened very, very, very simply because I have six sons and one of them was there <clears throat> telling me a wonderful, funny story about an event on Staten Island where he had been visiting. And I was thinking about one I had been also funny on Staten Island, but quite a while ago. I was getting ready for my anecdote. 
And after he finished his story, I had a sentence. And I said it, and it came out like the sentence as a tune, but all the words were random. They were just bizarre. They were not imitative of any other words. They weren't. They were real words, but uh, not coherent and not ap apposite at all to any idea of mine. And he, he's very polite, and he's a very hard-headed fellow. And he, he looked down at, at his lap and kind of looked at me and said something or other. And I tried to say something else, and it came out also garbage. So I said, oh, God, I've had a stroke. I knew. Why did I know that's what it was? I don't know why that's what I, I was convinced. Anyway, I had a pad on my lap, as I often do. And I quickly wrote the phone number and the address of the two people at that number. One of them runs the emergency room at a uh, New York hospital. And then I tried to make a sentence, which was not coming out very well. But I said, I cannot speak coherently. I gave him the page to look at. And thank God, it was that one of my hard-headed children. Uh, he didn't say, oh, why don't you lie down, dear, or let me get you a cup of tea or anything. He just took out his cell phone and called the number. And the guy on the other, said, on the other end of it said, the ambulance is coming. So that was that. That's how I got into it. And I, I, don't, I don't know that I was able to say anything. I couldn't. At that point, I, I said to the man in the ambulance my name, spelled, and my telephone. And then I just closed down. There was nothing. And uh, fortunately, I felt I was in safe hands, and I just didn't pay any more attention to anything. And the next thing I realized, I was being wheeled into a room for s four beds with, with people stricken in various levels by stroke. And I thought I was going to die. And, uh, I was quite calm about that. I was relieved, as a matter of fact, that I wouldn't have to make up any noble f last words. I just, you know, whew. I knew that I'd sign my will and my living will. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, this is, nothing hurts. Uh, so that's it, you know, goodbye. And I went to sleep. I thought I would be one of that 10,000 out of every person uh, has one soul who, who has the good luck to die in their sleep. So I thought, oh, I'm one of them, you know. And the, <laughs> the doctor at the emergency room had seen that my bed from the door he came over to me just as I had come in. He said, don't think a thing about it at all. I'll take your stuff with you. I'm going to move you next to the door. I was stuck to the door. He said, you're too close to the door. I'm going to move you. So the next thing I knew, I slept very well. I woke up, and it was sort of like, like a, an icon. The dawn was rising over the East River. So. <laughs> Oh, well, shit, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> now what do I do? from Joseph Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a... <clears throat> Is this typical, or have you heard this story before? This type of experience where somebody could actually write phone numbers down, information, but... Well, I guess it was an evolving stroke, and then it... That's right. I was getting deeper. Yeah, she was, and she was fortunate in getting to the hospital in time where they treated her and, uh, and were able to stop the severe clotting that would have resulted in more permanent uh, in severe injury. I don't know what the imaging studies showed, how bad the damage was. 
I won't ask you unless you want to volunteer. Yeah, sure. But as a neurologist, I'm always interested in the areas of the brain that are involved. You know. But um, uh, yes, I, I think she obviously had her wits about her in, in the beginning to do what was appropriate. And uh, but as you go deeper into language disorder, then of course, you, even if you're speaking, you you don't know what you're saying is correct, and you may you may. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a play, I don't know if some of you saw it, called Wings by Arthur Copet, I think. Was it by Copet? Yes, I have. And uh, Constance, Constance Cummings, was it? Is it? And I, it's been a long time since I've seen the play, but it's about a, a, someone with an aphasia. And what was it? Well, the thing about it that uh, struck me is that when... When uh, at one point she had neologistic jargon, that is, that wrong words with superimposed phonological errors. For example, if she wanted to say table, uh, let's say if she wanted to say chair, let's say she might say table, but on top of table she might say to bibble or something. So from chair to bibble, you don't see the connecting link, but the connecting link is a semantic error with a superimposed phonological or speech sound there on top of that. And uh, that kind of aphasia evolves in two different directions. It evolves back to pure phonetic errors or phonological errors, and we have a name for that kind of aphasia, or it evolves to pure semantic errors, and we have a name for that kind of aphasia. Now, in the play, she had symptoms of both, but when she was thinking out loud, so to say, uh, and she had to communicate with the audience. So for a, as a strategy, you couldn't write a play where someone was talking nonsense for 10 minutes on the stage. So she was using a semantic, she had semantic errors, so it was more or less meaningful. But when she was communicating with the doctors, it was phonological on top of the semantic, and you could understand there's talking nonsense. But it also raises the interesting question is, is the thought life of the aphasic consist more of semantic problems, but when they go to speak, it engages the phonology, and then that adds the phonetic problem, so the words are doubly distorted, so to say. Uh, that, that's something that occurred to me, but there, it is a play about a woman with an aphasia uh, of the type in general that may be similar to the one you had. And when you would look at a chart, when you would look at the scan, would you have a sense from looking at that what was going on with a person, or is, is it individual in every case? With a person, you mean, or with a language? Yeah, like if you're looking at the, at the brain scan. Well, I don't know. So, you know, we used to be able to localize these things very well until the imaging came along, and then we found that all of our, all of our scholarly localizations were all wrong, you know? The lesions were not where they were supposed to be, and so on. So, uh, but generally, this is left temporal lobe and uh, in a right-hander, and uh, so uh, probably not an enorm enormous lesion. I would also say it's an interesting phenomena that uh, over 90% of people who have a massive right, right brain stroke and left-sided paralysis are completely awake throughout the entire experience. Hmm. And about 80 or 90% of people with massive left brain strokes are awake. Uh, yeah, I think it's about, maybe it's a little less. It's more common with the right side. So you can basically almost lose half your brain and still be awake. It's more, the loss of consciousness is more common with left side, probably because of the language localization of the left brain. But uh, unlike a concussion where you might have a little bump on the head and you're unconscious, where the base of the brain is involved. So um, being awake throughout this whole experience is not unusual. Uh, and she was fortunate that it was evolving so it could be caught, but also that it was not so bad in the beginning that she was able to uh, write down and give some information to her son. And uh, then from our conversations earlier, I understand that it progressed to more of a jargon type of phenomenon, which we could... Dorothy, at what point did you come into meeting Marie? And, oh, and much, much more. <laughs> Much later, <laughs> just yes. more recently. Yes. But uh, I had another patient who said she first discovered she had the stroke when she was, it was, she got up in the morning, she was trying to address an envelope, and she started to do it, and she realized she wasn't doing it right, so she tried again, and it still wasn't coming out right. She tried again. She didn't know what the matter was. Hmm. 
And she's trying over and over. She said she must try for half an hour. And then she gave up. She went to tell her sister something, and it wasn't coming out. And her sister recognized she had the stroke. So you know, some, you know, you don't know if it's speech or writing that's affected first. I, I once had a patient who uh, uh, was brought in by his wife, and apparently he'd had a stroke with loss of language uh, about six months earlier. And, I, and she hadn't noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. It's hard to believe. And she said, uh, well, he would say uh, hello in the morning, <laughs> night and <at> night, <laughs> watch television. I didn't, know. I didn't know what he was aphasing. That's pretty bad. For <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Marie, how, how... For me, the, the thing that comes to my mind talking about this, everyone I've talked to, and a fair number of people in the last few months, that every one of those people has a close relative or a dependent or themselves who've had a stroke. And I discovered that it is the third largest way you die of in the United States of America. There are a couple of other numbers for other maladies, but this particular one is very common. It's a very, very, very common event. And it can be a physical or uh, psychological, but they're all brain events. The, the, the strike is at the, bra- at, the, at the event. And, and it occurs to me that, that in a funny way, it's a car- cardiological thing because you've had uh, atrial fib- fibrillation going on, the, the cascading clots, so that's, that's, that's a heart problem going on, right? And then this, these clots are sailing around and somebody blocks a piece of the brain. And then it becomes neurology, right? It's, it's, it's sort of between two stools in a way. That, uh, as a person with this malady, I would like the, the event to be thought of a lot as important about stroke, 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 stroke. Don't call it something else. A little heart problem, people say. Or, I twisted my ankle or, you know, people conceal the idea of the stroke very and quickly. is that about shame, do you think? Or they're worried about repercussions of uh, but, but it, I think it? the person is ashamed. Uh, Many writers have had them and don't admit because it. Because of the stereotype that is... Uh, I mean, many writers have had it and don't admit it. Is what yes, and, uh, or very slowly. And sometimes their publisher doesn't want to say too much about it either. You know, I've heard all those events. Don't, you know, let me, let's get the book out, and then we'll talk about it. You know? what, what made you decide to go? I mean, it was at first a very private affair in your case as well, or... or those of us who knew were sworn to secrecy and so forth by your children. But, right. but at some point, I opened the New York Times and there was an article in the New York Times about your recovery. What made you decide to not be one of the people who was going to disguise it or hide it? Because of all the silence, I think, is very dangerous to research and funding for research. And people who do the hands-on work with patients don't get the kind of funding money to find out more about what's going on. Naming the, the brain, we can do a lot better as my life has gone through. I'm 89. Different things are described in different ways. And we learn more and more and more. And it begins to sound as though the active uh, expression of Uh, neurons and everything is going on for a longer time than anybody ever thought. That's all very cheerful. But what do we figure out of this whole trajectory for the stroke when it starts with this cascade of clots sailing around your blood system to right now the person out in the world stuck with it well, how do we treat them? What do we talk about them? Do we have to think there's somebody dribbling broken in the corner as when they hear the word stroke? 
on the way out, pretty soon we'll get rid of them? Or are there more things to do? First of all is that research. I just think somehow or other such a malady could be put into all the parts, put, put into one synchrony with all the parts and, and see as the way cancer did. I remember in 1950 when I had people, a, a husband who would, don't tell his wife whatever, it'll kill her. Don't tell her she has cancer. Uh, we have changed all that. It's been a, a publicizing and an um, enormous amount of research and it really is a better thing. I think that's what we need. How I, often, how long do you feel it took you, uh, medical treatments aside, you, you know, to stabilize you, but before some kind of um, teaching or, or participation was being asked of you to see what your skills yeah, were? It, it occurred to me uh, having heard an unfortunate incident in, uh, in the uh, hospital. Uh, a poor, good-intentioned, very young, not very experienced person who wanted to convince me that I was an idiot, really, basically. She really wanted me to do that. She gave me... Um, d I had I had said no. I didn't think I had any trouble taking my medication. Or I had indicated it anyway. I could take my medications by myself, and she was trying to tell me that I better get somebody to help me who would do all this. So she gave me a, a bottle that I had, one of those children-proof closures, and I said I can't do it. That thumb is very arthritic and very sore, and. No pharmacy who knows me would bring me those pharmacy things. She said, well, you can't read it. That's why you can't read it and you can't tell it. So I said, no, I can read it. I would tell the pharmacist to take, to call me up. They brought the wrong top, bring it back, make me another bottle with one that I can open because I am... I have no children in the department, in the, in the apartment anywhere. I had been scheduled to leave for the department, for the apartment, for the hospital that day. And my numbers all went up to the upper 170. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And they stuck me in the hospital for another day because I was so cross-tempered <laughs> about this intervention of this poor little intern, I could have wrung her neck. When you're working with a patient, Dorothy, do you, do you come in at this point? Is, do you feel like this is a place where you enter to do your yes, work? Yes, it would have been her instead. Oh, well, paradise. I, w I do home care, so I would have seen you after you came home, and I would say, can you read what's on this bottle? <laughs> but but you're, you're right to distinguish between what the real problem was and what they were trying to say the problem was. Right. They would have brought me back. And my very own child took the medicine down and they sent me back up the bottle with these proof cups. I couldn't get the caps. I couldn't get the damn thing off. How do you like that happened to me? So there. I Dorothy, I'm not clear what you do actually in this situation. When you can't you, get the no, uh, what you what you do in the home? No, with her, and, and you know, trying to get a poet writing poetry again. Say, oh, oh never's going to get me writing poetry. No, sir, I'm not doing that yet. Not yet. It's coming. It's my friend. Well, most people I go to see, unfortunately, they want a magical solution. I'll come in for two hours a week, and they will magically recover. <coughs> But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. No, I was there in the summer when you weren't if, there. If so. I, had a, I wish I had a magic pill I could just give people and they would get better and I'd make a lot of money. But What do you do, though? <laughs> what, is the, what, are the, what is the... Uh... Basic, basically, what I tell people is they have to talk because the more you do anything, right. the better you get at it. And but nice. as a therapist, what I do is I try to give them situations that are graded in difficulty so they can talk. 
So if, if talking is very difficult, you try to make it a situation which is easy to talk. Then you gradually make the situation a little more challenging. And you individualize it to each person. That's the therapy part. And are you also you know, calibrating some kind of test to see like how far are they, where are they doing? Are you doing that simultaneously while you're, while you're trying to get their skill to improve? Are you also sort of trying to take a test to see what what She's is actually going on? He's not a tester. <laughs> well, you okay. do a little testing to find out what's happening because if a person just sits there, you don't know how they're able to speak. But she then, seems more articulate than most people who haven't had stroke. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But but all as those you go big along, words about the cardio stuff and all that. I mean, as we go along, you don't have to keep testing because you can see what they're doing well and what they're still having difficulty with as you go along. You look like you have something you want to say there. I'm, I'm, I'm almost scared to open the can of worms for me. The can of worms for me is that I'm asking for more than the moon. You want to know this question of what poetry is. I am not touching it because it's my safe house. I've been writing poems since I was eight or something, publishing since eight. Uh, and I feel that it's okay. I feel that I have written maybe, maybe, maybe 14 or 15 things that are like skeletons of, of poems because that time is not void. But I'm not gone back to re- haven't gone back to read them at all. I haven't thought about them or puzzled around about them. I'm just leaving them alone because I'm, I'm the writing of prose. New, these are new pieces? Or these yes, are, these, are these are new. They yes, but they're post- skeletal. Okay. You know, they're okay. sketches, scribbles. Um, because I want my I want my pleasure in the writing uh, before I uh, in prose before I come back to the poems. I can write expository. Uh, essay without any problem. I give me a name. I don't care what it is. I'll fake it up. Uh, I give you a hypothesis. I give you evidence, and I give you a thesis. Boom, done. I can do it. I get the syntax right. I usually think. Well, I spell everything right anyway. Um, but the kind of writing that I'm accustomed to doing, I write for ten minutes every day, right? I write it. I write the subject, and the syntax cannot be completed by predication. I, I'm, I'm up to there, and the moment that I expect that gives me joy is the new word is coming after that one. Get it down fast, and and it stops at the subject. There's another such baffled. It's, I'm just baffled. Every once in a while I break through and I get to it and I get on to the next idea. And in, I've been working away at this consciously for uh, three months now. Uh, th- two or three times I have had that sense of the the pleasure of the new joy, of the new idea coming along. By new idea, I mean new to me, simply, probably, maybe to everybody else. But the one that is new to me has reconceived something that I want to say. And until that's in place, I'm not going to touch those poems. As a teacher, I've heard you say that you work on a poem, you revise a poem, you maybe go back to one of those skeletons. Hundred times. Not, not this for time correction. Time you make that very clear. You say not for correction, but for discovery. That's right. Yes, right. In the it's phase good. that you're in right now, do you feel like you're in a in a corrective mode? Ever or is, has that been a struggle? I I don't aim at correct. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, um, the correction I'm trying to do up here is is more like practicing. I keep, I keep writing. I, I've been put in, put a very stringent dose of writing, 
an hour for nonstop writing. Don't stop and reflect and write wisely. Just keep going. Don't quit. Just go. And by the time I'm uh, up with my hour, I'm damn ready to sick of it. You know, it's all not what I want. I want that wonderful thing. And it's, there's nothing wrong with it. And I look back at those. I look back at that. But it's just boring to me. As yeah. a, may I ask a, uh, a question? If you, I'm, I'm curious as to what you what you notice about your ability to formulate uh, words or phrases uh, internally, mentally, inner speech. That's why I started to do an hour of writing. It worked with talk to get out of that thing at first for the first close to two months. It felt like a translation. I did once at one point... uh, simultaneous uh, writing, uh, reading of, over, a microphone, over a microphone from French to English. And that instantaneous is um, like that feeling of going underneath it and translating it. There's something I have in my mind that I sort of want to say, but I, it's not going to say itself. So I go under it and speak at the, at the other side of it. Well, it came to mind when you were talking about the predication because uh, um, some theorists think that inner speech is largely predicated because the, uh, the topic is, of course, known to the speaker. So, um, and it's more the more dynamic aspect of, the, of predication. So um, that, that's lost. And people have argued that it's lost or damaged or disrupted in in your kind of aphasia, but it's also impaired in other other kinds. Uh, I would imagine that some writers compose in their heads and then put it down on paper, but probably more writers uh, constantly revise, write something, and then they revise it and work it over and over. You know, eventually, they, but the second the famous remark that uh, S. J. Perelman was asked how he gets that feeling of spontaneity in his writing. He said, well, for spontaneity usually requires at least 23 drafts. And he says, and, no, and sometimes, sometimes when I've done 30, it has a certain je ne sais quoi. Yeah. <laughs> if I had more time, I would have written the last. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is not too- so I, the point is that the writing itself is propelling more writing. The writing, the uh, writing generates the writing. Well, generative is the writing word that is, Marie will use frequently generative. as a teacher. She's interested in methods of teaching that are regenerative, and you're interested in the observation for that reason. And that was a question I wanted to ask you in terms of your treatment. A professional visits you in the hospital, visits you at home. How much of what was being done with you did you feel was generative? The persons coming to my home were of great benefit because I got advice from a neurologist at NYU who had given the usual thing with her little residence around attentively and being she was uh, they, were, they were ready to mine for the next and learning that lesson and, and it's always a, a rather touching thing and they gave me the thing I was a little cross at first and then she was uh, uh, doing her job so I got, I made nice <laughs> and uh, what day is it Today. <laughs> Do you know the date today? <laughs> it's, it gives everybody the same set of questions. She must have had thousands and thousands of them. And it must give her a take on the patient she's never met before. <laughs> This is how this person does it, right? It must have that reason. I don't know what else reason there could be for it. But uh, they they need that. They need that, so they go through it. They do it. And they all smiles, and they were just about to turn around to the next one, and I found speech. I, I had been 
not really. I, I might have said, said words that I don't remember, but it was, this was day four. And I said, Doctor, I need help. <laughs> not a thing I'm used to doing in all my life, you know. Ah, get smart. I need help. I need help. I need help. And she just turned into a human being. She wheeled around. She looked me right in the eye, which nobody except this one nurse had ever done that since I was there. They were looking at the bed, and so had I. I was melting into the bed with this little light in the brain of my head. She said, what do you want me to do for you? As if she meant it. And I said, speech, <laughs> like, you know. And she gave me a, a, a great talk. She said, talk, she said. You do it yourself. You talk for yourself. You talk to people you like. You talk all the time. You talk as much as you can. You talk about things you like. Talk about that and keep talking. And then, and she, she was right, the, then the hard part comes. And then, listen to what they say back to you and take it in and see if you can ask them another question about what they said. Well, did I know? There was another joke in this, by the way. I wanted to know I had a bunch of, uh, asked a couple of people to bring me in a couple of books, and, and I said, uh, read. And she said, <laughs> well, she said, do you like to write, to read? <laughs> Every, you know, one a book, right? <laughs> one, one a day, one a book. And I, I, I laughed, which I hadn't done since I came to the hospital. And I said, yes. And she said, read out loud. Read to other people. Get other people to read to you. Read out loud uh, for yourself. And that was about, that was about the, the best instruction anybody ever got. One of the things I noticed when I'd visit you, especially early on, you know, there might be two or three people coming in. Yeah. They would say, how are you? What's going on? How are you feeling? And you'd get those questions. The repetition was deadly for me as a visitor. Just, <laughs> just me for as a visitor, it was deadly. So, so the the attention on you with that kind of question was clearly difficult. It was exhausting. So I began to visit you with somebody else, and I always came with another person, and I brought a different person every time, and we would talk, and we would come in the room talking and we would just talk amongst ourselves, the two of us, and you would listen. And we'd start talking about poetry, we'd talk about all sorts of things, That's right. like we do. And then maybe 10 or 15 minutes into that, you would always suddenly come into the conversation, and you'd enter the conversation, and we would not have known anything had happened to you. You, you were yeah, totally, so and the moment we turned it to you, and the focus was on you, the kind of wall went up. So I don't know. Would you say that's generative? Uh, well, I was, I was thinking as you were talking about the first patient I ever saw with aphasia when I was a medical student in California. And uh, the professor, Nielsen, he was at the time the most famous aphasiologist in, in the country, uh, grabbed my arm and said, come here, I want to show you something. And I was a first or second year medical student. And he brought me over to the bedside of a patient, and he said to the patient, he said, good morning. And the patient said, good morning. How are you? Fine. How are you? What's new? Nothing. What's new with you? Nothing. And back and forth like that. And then, and then the doctor said, what did you have for breakfast? And then he came out with jargon. He couldn't speak. He couldn't. So there were these automatisms of everyday life were preserved. In, in this particular case, I, have, I can't say I've seen that. It was really quite astonishing to see that. I'll never forget it. Um, I, let me make, as long as I have a moment to speak here, I'll just make a comment about a couple of things that were brought up. One has to do with your discussion of the arc, the trajectory of recovery, and why don't we study this more? 
And I think you're absolutely right. I think it's crucial to do that. Uh, during the days when I was reviewing grants at NIH myself, and I would push for people to do recovery studies, you cannot get a good recovery study funded by the government. And the reason for that is because it can take three or four or five years. You, no, no two patients are the same. You have to control for age, for gender, for type of stroke, for area of damage, for severity, and, and which means in sort of the jargon of research people, the cells that you need uh, for con to control for all of these variables are, you need hundreds and hundreds of cases followed over many years. So this, the study becomes very expensive and, and very difficult to do. Um, and that's why we don't have more. I, the reason I think it's important to, to study that is because the way language deteriorates and the way language recovers tells you about how things hang together in the mind, how, which, what goes with what. So, I mean, for example, does spelling improve with, when calculation improves? These are both analytic tasks. Do they recover together or separately? There are studies, for example, that were done years ago in Israel in bilinguals where they gave aphasics therapy in Hebrew, and if they recovered in Hebrew, they recovered in their, their other language, Russian, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. If they didn't recover in Hebrew, they didn't show recovery. So there's generalization across the languages. So this whole question of generalization, to me, is very interesting and needs to be studied more. And the last comment I made, well, the last because I don't want to talk too long, but the, I'm hear more about the experiences here than my, my work. But the last thing I would say is that um, during that period of, uh, of medical training, I was also uh, involved marginally in the case of Patricia Neal, the actress. And she had a, uh, at UCLA, and she had a very severe stroke with an aphasia. And her husband, uh, whose name escapes me, the writer. Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl. Yeah, Roald Dahl. And he also wrote a book about that. Uh, uh, he that. may well have, but yeah. he, uh, my understanding is he really dedicated himself full time to his wife's recovery, working with her day and night. I've told my wife, I said, if I should have a stroke and I should have an aphasia, I said, hire a, a, a pretty speech therapist to come and <laughs> work with me 40, full time. Hire her full time. Uh, instead of paying by the session, just pay for her annual salary and work with me all day long if I have the stamina for it and I have the will and the motivation to, because you're quite remarkable, really, for wanting to f fight this thing because a lot of people after a certain point in life just sort of feel well what's the point you know and you don't have the motivation of, of a much younger person so uh, that has to be there too mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a huge question that's really the right what, what the heck, why don't I just relax you know <laughs> Well, writing is, you know, writing I've always thought of as a kind of an illness from which one has to kind of recover. <laughs> I, think, and, and I think that's I, quite true. I, I, I do think it's sort a of a compulsion. I schizophrenia on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I once told a friend that. I said, you know, if God came to me in a vision and said, Jason, nobody's going to ever read a word you write for the rest of time. I said, I still write. And he was laughing, and I felt a little stupid for saying that. And then a few uh, months later, I was watching an interview uh, which actually goes to one of the points that you brought up earlier, an interview with one of my favorite writers who I mentioned, Borges. And uh, he said something like that. He said, if all my books should fall to the bottom of the ocean, and uh, he said I would keep on writing. So the interviewer asked him the right question. He said, well, if you don't care if anybody's going to read your books, uh, why, do you, why do you publish? He said, oh, well, the only reason to publish is to avoid endless revision. <laughs> 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 Marie, back to a question I have, I've been thinking about, about the actual text of the poem that you're working on. How much of what you're working on when you, when you feel like you're not getting the little magic moment that takes you, how much of that might be connected to abstraction of the poem? Like trying to move language in a... In a, in a abstraction? Well, or, or to move it in an area where that's not naturally the way the syntax would have gone as a poet, you take language to a new place. And is there anything of that in it? No, no. I, I just want I just want the old days. I want to go back to the way I like to do. My motivation as a writer is pleasure. I love it. I do it because I like to do it. 
And part of the rewards of writing are fresh ideas. Things come differently to me. It's very exciting. It's very, very, very pleasant. So there, that's my motivation. And that really is even, even the most dogged hundredth version of some damn thing that I'm not making come right, I will go back with pleasure to it. So. The other thing about all of this is that in writing, well, as in everyday speech, I mean, when you're sitting there with a pen and paper, and you're waiting for something to come up. You're waiting for it to come out. And the more passive you are, the, 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 sometimes the, the better it is. And the more worked over, it may lose some of that freshness and the quality that you're seeking. And one of the things that happens in aphasia is that language becomes deliberate. You have to kind of think about what you, you think about what you're saying, and you lose the automatic, spontaneous quality of words. Just I'm not thinking about what I'm saying now. I may I may be making sense or not, but the words just come out. I don't think about it, and uh, that's the, that is what's lost that automatic spontaneous quality of language and it shifts into a more deliberate it's like having to think about every step you're taking when you're walking instead of just walking yeah, yeah. Marie, how, there is, there how is helpful is form to you when you're working in this way you once told me that during a very difficult part of your life the way you kept your sanity was you to write a song yeah, yeah. And how how is well, that? Well, the form is, is always. It's like if you have if you have a a form of a, 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 a sentence, you're enclosed within another set of boundaries, safer. Yet you can't. You don't have to. You can't stay silent really when you have all that safety to go to, and. Uh, and and not um, worry about the thing that is tremendously worrying about you because it's something you can't fix someone whose life you can't fix and is driving you crazy and you're worried sick one of my children I thought was going to kill himself and it, it was no use to him whatsoever to do any of the things that I was able to think of. So I would leave it all alone and not go crazy and write a sonnet and, and bother him, not bother him. He, that was what the problem was. Did you do any solution to a lot of things? I went all the way from New York to Houston. I suffered. For, I spent a, a, two semesters at the University of Houston. Uh, Did you write down any of your aphasic productions? Um, yeah. Some, uh, like when you were that was while I was the, but yeah. the, the, the yeah. ra random things well I don't know random I wouldn't say random but I would say did you if you were did you try writing down something even if it came out and you were you, you didn't know whether it was right or wrong or you didn't like it it would be interesting to look at those samples and see I, I have some samples they're very funny I have that note in which I said I cannot speak coherently uh, that that seems to me like a very comical <laughs> remark no, no, nothing, at this point. Nothing like uh, nothing coherently. Like, wow! Well, you didn't write anything like Dylan Thomas's. Um, if my head hurt, a hare's foot packed back the down bone. Yes, right. You, you yeah. didn't write anything like that, did you? Uh, I would I would like something to be cooked for me. You know? <laughs> but I I have also had a certain point in my life when it was a brand new uh, book in the United States was Finnegan's Awake. I spent a lot of time on it. I spent a, a famous professor was teaching all us graduate students who could do parts of it. I was invited in because I knew Latin and was Catholic. And you know that was that fits all the things that are in Joyce's work. Uh, Oh, I've forgotten my mind. I'm lost into the world of Tyndall. Anyway, this the the, the incoherent of uh, Dylan Thomas is is uh, I think if only I knew Welsh, I could I could figure out why, where his problems were coming from. It's not deep thought so much as it is extremely intricate, beautiful language. Yeah. The other the other thing that interests me is uh, nothing of course to do with you, but it's schizophrenic. Uh, 
uh, aphasic-like uh, productions. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a year at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., where, where, and I'd gone there because that's where Ezra Pound was hospitalized. I was hoping to meet him, but uh, he had been discharged a year or two before I arrived. And I, I spent uh, a lot of the time reading the cantos. And one of the things that impressed me very much about that was the, the quality of his writing, which is, you know, intelligible, but uh, had a kind of a funny quality, you know. Mm -hmm. So a sentence like, shines in the mind of heaven, God who made it more than the sun in our eye, makes a kind of uh, elliptical sense, sort of. I mean, it's not that clear. And even in this context of, the, of, this, uh, of what he was writing about, it didn't really make any sense, but it stood out as a very unusual but really lovely sentence that you couldn't kind of logically figure out. Shines in the mind of heaven God who made it more than the sun. I, what he was even talking about. And uh, so, uh, and, and there are many other examples of, uh, of uh, psychotic language. And he was a paranoid schizophrenic. At least that was his diagnosis. I mean, maybe you'd think he was a, you know, prosecuted for war crimes or whatever. But, but um, uh, I, uh, he behaved like a schizophrenic, and, uh, but still quite brilliant uh, and giving lectures at the, on the lawn of uh, St. Elizabeth's to T.S. Eliot, Gertrude Stein, lots of people who would come to listen to him talk. So, uh, but I think he's a good example. And there might be other, other uh Writers or poets who are psychotic, mm. that would be very interesting to study. Um, one of my, uh, uh, Holderlin is one of my favorite poets, the German uh, uh, romantic uh, idealist philosopher poet, Holderlin. And uh, he became, he was, entered in, he was institutionalized in his 30s after writing some of the most beautiful poetry I've ever read. And I uh, was a friend of Goethe's and, and that whole circle in Vienna. And uh, I don't know if he wrote when he was institutionalized, but I'm sure there are many other examples that I can't, uh, I don't have at the tip of my fingers, but that would be fascinating to study. And there, um, when I, many years ago when I came to New York, I, I, I spent some time working with a psychiatrist named Silvano Arietti. And Silvano was very well known for his work in schizophrenia. And we studied word salad together. Uh, and an example of word salad, uh, it could be total babble in, in regressed schizophrenics, but one example would be uh, the cow burnt the house horrendously always. That's an example he liked to use. The, how, the, cow, the cow burnt the house not horrendously, but horrendously always. Mm -hmm. And so it has a kind of, a, you know, it's a little, it sounds a little strange, but it has a kind of interest because it's so unexpected, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you can get those kinds of utterances in, in psychotics. And I, so I, I do wonder sometimes whether, you know, in psychosis we're tapping into lower or earlier phases in the generation of language, um, phases of meaning, uh, dreamlike thought, uh, and so on. I'm here in a psychoanalytic setting, so I, I guess I can talk like this. Primary process, <laughs> Primary process like thinking. And so you wonder whether or not in the, in the mental life of the aphasic, <clears throat> when, especially when there's a surface phonology is um, stripped away, whether the underlying uh, um, lexical ability, word, thinking and so on, how thought is affected uh, without phonology, and whether one can think uh, wordlessly. What is, it, what is it like to think wordlessly if you've lost words? Uh, other than in visual images, uh, can you? Th I mean, there are a lot of very interesting questions that are raised, and it might be. Well, also, how much can the visitor, or how much can the practitioner assist with that? Which is a very different kind of information. Let me see if I can say. When when I visited you the first day, you were getting excellent medical care. You were getting family attention, and all of that was going on around your hospital bed. And I left the hospital thinking, it's not generative. What That's can right. we send to generate? And I stood in front of the hospital. I, 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 I called another poet. And maybe, all right, it's been quite, I called Sapphire. And I said, Maria's had a stroke. And 
I know that Sapphire has the kind of energy and personality, and I knew that she would hold the confidence because nobody gets any news from her, and I was sworn to secrecy by the family. But she said, I'm in Brooklyn. She said, I'll come up this afternoon, like, like that, which is what you want. And she came with notebooks for you. It was my first full day in the hospital. And she brought the MoMA little collection of notebooks as a gift, and she said, try writing in the notebooks. And she Marie really couldn't that. write at that point. She You're, didn't say that. Uh, well, that's, that's what I, okay. She just said, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a, this, this is for you, and there was these six little books and a pen. And I just have thought of many stories about other incidents of instrumentality. There's an object that fits the hand that you're going to write with. I mean, if you're a writer, that's what you do. I've been doing 10 minutes a day for 50 years. First of all was her extremely confident, smiling face. You're looking fine, she said to me. I was a piece of wet rag, nowhere. <laughs> and I agreed, and as soon as she left, I looked at my watch, and I, I did 10 minutes of time. Wow. <laughs> and it was, had, it was very bizarre. Mm -hmm. Not very bizarre. But that's instinctual. It was not very too. bizarre. It was, it was credible. But I, uh, I don't know what I was, I don't know what that ever made, you know, it didn't make any sense in the context at all. So I, and I had a couple of words that my hand wrote that was not connected from anything. They just were extraneous, so I'd crossed them out. I wrote a line underneath it and said, I will try again. And I took another 10 minutes, and I wrote for 10 minutes. It came out a little bit better. Of course, we don't really know if you hadn't done anything, if you'd be the same. To mm -hmm. We don't. We don't. We don't really know whether the therapy is... is I was talking about about birds, dolphins, and whales. And, and I had put on another page, em, em, elephants qu query. I was talking about human speech, the double syrinx of the birds, and, and about these orders as late learners of language. That's what I was thinking about while I was lying there early along two weeks ago, you know, before I had a stroke. And it came all back to me, and that's what I was writing. Like, what nonsense? I don't know anything about these subjects. I did feel, though, that there, and, and this is my own observation, but sending excitement that surrounded language. Like, I oh, knew Sapphire right. wasn't going to come in and say, that's well, right. how are you yeah, doing? Oh, my true. dear, you had a stroke. I knew she was going to come in with some energy and force and say, like, poetry is alive well, in this room. Well, I think it's important to yeah. kind of, you know, juice the patient up and get them talking and activated. But and so what's I, interesting instead to Instead of them. watching TV or vegetating, I think that's right, very important. Right, but what's important. interesting to them? You know, not, yeah, right. and not okay. like what pill are you taking? I know, but, but, I know, but if we were going to do recovery studies, you know, we'd have one patient like you who's getting XYZ type of therapy, intensive, one, there are many different methods of therapy that are used, so we wanted another therapy, and another patient like you who wouldn't be getting therapy at all. That's the control group. Uh, and then well, watch God, you... That's going to happen in spite of us. Watch you over <laughs> six months. The, the, the major recovery occurs in the first six to 12 months, usually. And then, mm -hmm. Well, in most cases, it, it does. I mean, you, if you have continued, I'm not saying you don't have continued no, continue therapy. People keep improving year after year after year yeah. if they work yeah, at but, it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've seen right. that. I, I, I have a rehab program myself, so I'm, I'm comfortable with that statement, but I'm saying the maximum, not maximum, major degree of recovery is usually in the first year or so. And, um, and that's the period when the therapy is, facilitates, I think, natural recovery. But uh, after that, it's a kind of a long, hard slog, so to say. Well, I, I think we all improve a little bit now and then. I had written a kind of a prophecy in a book that I published uh, 
about a year ago of poems. I had tried to put in a lot of little things, apothegms, so little, little jingles, any old kind of thing, of a different kind to break this mortal 20th century massive paragraph of sober remarks. <laughs> I wanted to put a couple like that in. There are a couple, because that's what I write. What can I say? But I wanted a mix of the other kind of language-making poems of other kinds. And one of them I will recite for you, because it's not difficult. It's called Simples. And it says, uh, what do I want? Well, I want to get better. Right? And that's right now taken. That's my mentor. Like that, that's my haiku. And it's, 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 I, I write. Are you I, able to rhyme? <laughs> yes, I do. I, I ask you because rhyming is I do very, very difficult for people with aphasia. Uh, oh, no. It t tends to be very good. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, it's, it's most memorious. I, I've lost all, I have hundreds of poems. So I teach literature, right? And I teach hundreds and hundreds of things. Half of them are gone. I don't even know what they are because they're gone. They're gone, gone, gone. Others of different poems, many of them rhymes. Uh, I would have thought very dear to me, I, would, I was, would certainly know that, and I would try to say it and not be able to get there. And then in the middle of a sentence, I said to someone, I may get this wrong, uh, in the deserts of the heart, let the healing fountain start. And then I said that out loud that I didn't know I remembered it and it remembered me and I couldn't remember the end of it and I said the last two couplet um, to say in the prison uh, in the prisons of our days teach the free man how to praise. Well, you're basically, I mean, what would have to really test you to doc demonstrate aphasia because you're speaking maybe not as fast as you did before, but you're speaking fluently and grammatically and correctly. And uh, maybe I hear a very rare false start or uh, you would say you started to say I think preface and then you said prophecy something like that. So there may be a there may be some subtle subtle thing there listening to you. But I'm talking about generally people who have a, are a little more severely afflicted. Well, Mary and would reverse pronouns. She would say he for she, and she would reverse like you said table chair. You would say oh pull the table over here, and you meant the chair, and you would sometimes do that. I mean yeah. I think some of that has has gotten better. One time in July, I showed up at your house, and you said, on Tuesday, I stopped having trouble with conversations. I started to be able to understand that. You know, so there was a progression. So it, 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 was that, did they come back like suddenly? Did certain functions or abilities come back suddenly, or is it a purely <coughs> gradual recovery? Well, those couplets just came one after the other. In, at the end of a sentence, I had said about something about healing, and then, you know, I said, in the deserts of the heart, but the healing well, see, comes. I'm, but I'm, I'm giving it from the outside-in point of view. As a, someone who studies people with aphasia, you have, you have the inside-out perspective as someone who had it. And uh, when we test people... This we is add, very we, interesting. We'll, I'll, I'll check it out. We'll I'll give see. them a picture or a word like a cat and then give them three or four other pictures or words. Uh, had or what, which one rhymes with this one and this is a devilishly difficult task for someone with an aphasia why? I didn't understand that when you first said it well first of all it's also very it's something that the right brain can't do in split brain studies 
the right brain can't do syntax, it can't do uh, phonology, it can do semantics. So uh, that is, it can extract word meanings, but it can't, uh, it can't uh, deal. The other, the uh, phonological task generally, for example, if you give somebody a series of words that begin with the letter B, let's say, boy, hat, chair, bat, and you ask them to tap every time they hear the word that begins with a B, or you give them an embedded, so like every time they hear a TR uh, in a nonsense sound like batra, or batha, mm-hmm. and when they hear tr, they have to indicate, and they can't do that, uh, or they do it very poorly. Um, so we we just know that, and these are these are tests that, in the past, I've I've done pet studies on looking at using these uh, these uh, stimuli, uh, phonological stimuli, uh, as um, uh, as highly sensitive to aphasic deficits. Uh, so that, uh, well, I think the left brain is really the, the, involved with phonology. The, the frontal Broca's area, the posterior Wernicke's area, are areas for either phonetic or phonemic processing. And uh, as I say, something Maria's talked about teacher. She says, you know, I'm not interested in lexicon. I'm interested in syntax. As a poet, you've said that, and. And you know, you said it was get, getting the predicate that I was looking for. Yeah, and that. getting you know, taking language and throwing a bunch of words on the table in a random. Pa- in fact, I was worried that maybe you were going to become a language poet now. <laughs> 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 but the syntax is, is is everything, and and I think that was the frustration. Sometimes would be like, is this a cat? And you were bored to tears. You and maybe didn't know the answer, and felt. To my, you know, what I, I don't know. I'm speaking for you. I must try but. about rhyme because I probably am an, an a, I was a child of my age. I was used to be in a room with adults having knowledge of me, nothing. And I said nothing about with them. I just sat there quietly. That's what I was supposed to do. One of the things I used to do was sit and make rhymes. I would just make rap, rhyme sound a, a word and then other words that and I do that to these to these to these days when I'm really writing complicated sonnet I write very complicated sonnet forms <coughs> instead of with four rhyme words I have three and I usually double that because the last line becomes the first line of the next stanza, so it's even tight. It's extremely tight, and I, I write these rights down the margin of the little rhyming words. Well, you'll have to switch to free verse, I guess. So I might not be, I'm going to go home when I do it, I promise you. <laughs> Jackson, this may be a good time. We're getting to be, uh, we want to leave a little time for people to come up, and I think maybe this is a good time to mm-hmm. bring some questions up. And if, if there's anybody That's who good. Would like to, Terrific. That's what uh, I want to hear. To, uh, uh, come up, uh, come to the mic, say who you are, because it's really important that I know. My name is Richard Luskin, and my wife was diagnosed with this. She also was diagnosed as cortical basal degeneration. <coughs> she never was diagnosed that she had a stroke. So when you say about aphasia, all I hear is the only way it, was, it comes is from a stroke. She did not have that. She was diagnosed, as I said, first with uh, Alzheimer's. That was ruled out with all the medication, Aricepts included. She then was diagnosed with aphasia and dementia, and she was constantly deteriorating. She lost her power of speech, her locomotion, so I'm very confused with this. Well, you should. I don't think you should be, because uh, it's, uh, stroke is just one of many things that can cause language disorder but uh, or aphasia, but uh, anything that destroys uh, language parts of the brain, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's can, or trauma, or encephalitis, uh, inflammation, or a cyst in the brain, or uh, uh, anything that damages. The early, early work on aphasia was done largely in trauma cases, uh, because most of the main aphasia centers outside of the United States, in Europe and in, in the Soviet Union, developed in relation to, uh, for, to treat war, war uh, injuries. So these were mostly trauma cases. Uh, after the First World War and the Second World War, you had big aphasia centers 
everywhere, as I say, except in America. That's right. And even now, we don't have we don't have like some central center for treating trauma, which can cause a variety of things, including aphasia, depending on where the brain is uh, involved. So you also have no there's there's very little of uh, monetary pro- ways of getting this together. I tried to start a foundation for my wife. It was impossible, and I I called. Oprah Winfrey, I called uh, Lane Gen- DeGeneres. I wanted to go on to their programs. I did a million different things. I called a congressman from Arizona who had to step down because he had this disease, and I never got him on the phone. No one ever answered me. I well, there is anywhere. a particular kind of uh, Alzheimer's. We call it uh, progressive aphasic dementia, where the Alzheimer's attacks. I'm not saying that's the diagnosis here, but just to give you an idea of something other than stroke where the, it can uh, preferentially attack the left side of the brain, and you have progressive aphasia, mm-hmm. and other functions relating to other parts of the brain remain relatively well-preserved until late in the disease when pretty much everything goes. See, my wife lost all her power of speech. I know I'm taking enough time, but, you know, and, and, you know, she, she went to a, a therapist like you, and I had her in the, the, all kinds of things, and, and nothing ever helped. And if she I can say this. something to you, sir. What I'm hearing in your question is that you came here today hoping to find the clue or the secret that would help your wife. Well, my wife passed away. Oh, she passed away. I would okay. Like to help other people. But you would like yes. to help other people. But you're looking for the clue, and I think that we're all looking for the clue. Right. We had an opportunity to have a conversation today with somebody who is articulate, mm-hmm. post stroke and that's that's part of what we, we we don't even know what we're looking for we're talking hoping that something emerges that's useful to other people so in a way we share your frustration up here as well this lady amazes me because my wife couldn't even talk yeah 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 so I, I think i i think i was lucky <laughs> i think i was lucky one of the you know, yeah. It's a, I see a lot of people who can't do it. There, there is a center in Chicago. I'll give you. I'll, um, I can send you an email about it. Maybe you, they would be a good contact. Yeah. Uh, well, we have. Uh, you would like to uh, you first, and then you second, okay? And did you want to do a? Did you want to do something, Patricia? No, I don't want to do something. I know that Marie Marie is here as a poet, and I wondered whether. We could hear one poem, um, or maybe Jackson, uh, because she was talking about sonnets, structure, rhyme, and um, there's some really important stuff here. Well, we have I'm someone here with, with the question. Let's Thank go you. There and we'll Jackson, I'll let you have. You'll, you'll, you'll handle that when you. Yes, I mean, you, and you're, you're willing Jackson to read a poem. Okay. Sure. okay. Uh, I'm Jeremy Mack. I'm a psychiatrist here in the city. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about and the past about. Um, words and thought. And um, so I'm interested in hearing the, the concept of, of, I think, Riponso said that she had ideas, but she couldn't really get at them because of, uh, because of the lack of, of words. Am I misquoting Damasio, um, to say, if I understand him, to say that words were not, his sense was that words were not necessary for uh, for the uh, production of thought, and perhaps I, perhaps I am. Emotion. <clears throat> yeah. And um, uh, at any rate, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. Well, I, you know, you're raising one of the more, uh, one of the most complicated topics in, <clears throat> for those of us who study this field. And uh, uh, there's never been a good... One of, one, of the, one of the most famous uh, uh, neurologists uh, who studied language, his name was Kurt Goldstein. Maybe you've heard of him. He was, he, he, uh, and he, uh, he was married to, uh, I think, the daughter or granddaughter of Kassira, the philosopher. And uh, she was a little crazy, and she used to always taunt him when there were people in the, in the family uh, visiting in the house. Oh, Kurt, he's waiting for his uh, obituary in the New York Times. And um, he wrote a lot about inner speech and the nature of inner speech. And he, uh, he had a total aphasia, a stroke with an absolute total aphasia. He lived for one week and then he died. And uh, uh, ironically, the New York Times was on strike that day. 
but, but I thought, oh no. He, he, would have, he would have had an opportunity to uh, see if his own writings were correct or not. But generally, and Ling must wonder about this. Oh, for, okay, let me just say from my point of view, the question is, what do you think is a word like table or chair uh, stripped of its speech sounds? Okay, so when you get rid of the speech sounds, what is that sort of fuzzy little thing there? That's the word. It's a word frame of some sort where it may have syllabic slots to insert the, the phonemes. Uh, we speak of lexical frames, and that word, like the word chair, probably comes, I think, comes out of a background category of furniture. An error like table for chair and so on shows that the, you have a zeroing in on the target word through categories. Uh, there may be patients who could say, uh, instead of table, uh, they could say Venezuela or something like that, make a very peculiar response. That usually doesn't happen in aphasia, but it's, if it does, it's probably some association that they have in their mind about a certain kind of table and visiting Venezuela, but who knows? Um, but these are, um, there's a zeroing in on, on the target word, uh, and then at some point, there's a zeroing in on the target phonemes from wide phoneme feature distance. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be too technical here, but from wide distance, so that uh, if you want to say table, uh, you, instead of T, you might say D, table, which is phonetically close. But instead of, you wouldn't say Mabel, because that's phonologically more distant in terms of its phonological feature qualities. So there's a zeroing in on the, on the correct phonemes. And, uh, but at what point does a word uh, a lexical item, we say, or some word configuration in the mind become something that you can actually uh, manipulate or think about stripped of the sound of the word? And honestly, I don't really have an answer to that. And I don't think anybody does. And Tony Damasio I'm sh certainly doesn't. And uh, <laughs> but um, it's uh, it's something that has been um, the one person who did study speech in an interesting way many many years ago was a, a psychologist by the name of Vygotsky, a Russian uh, who died too early, and he studied children and the development of inner speech in children, and he found that children tend to speak while they're doing things. Uh, and they'll describe what they're doing or talk about what they're doing while they're doing it. Eventually they stop and that becomes internalized. And he thought it was internalized as inner speech. Uh, and then when they're given something difficult to do, it comes out again when they're challenged with a difficult task. And he wrote about inner speech as having this, as I mentioned earlier, this like the predicative quality, like you know the topic, you know it's you. You don't have to say I, I this or you know the topic. So, but you have to say something descriptive about the topic. And he thought inner speech was descriptive in that sense. Um, I don't know uh, really. Uh, I, I have a paper I just wrote on inner speech uh, in a journal called the Physiology. It's a kind of a. I'd be happy to send it to you, but try to come to grips with it because. It, with damage to the posterior brain, uh, you have, uh, actually I think it's in here in this book, uh, damage to the posterior brain, you have inner speech, if it exists, is, which is, has a hallucinatory quality. I think when you go to sleep at night, some of you may have the experience that I have, although I tend to be, because of my work, I tend to kind of imagine all kinds of things, but uh, hearing, you hear yourself talk, so inner speech can have a productive quality. You can be thinking about what you're going to say, and it can be sort of directed toward vocalization. We call that the preverbatum. Uh, the behaviorist thought of inner speech as something just lacking speech. It's all everything except the final speech. Uh, but uh, it can also go in a perceptual direction, and then it becomes sort of hallucinatory. And you can be lying in bed at night and, I, and hear voices in your head, and you don't know if they're hallucinations or your own when they seem to separate and they come out from outside then they're hallucinations when they're still internal it's your inner speech but inner speech is extremely complicated and I guess the bottom line answer is that we really haven't sorted it out and the question about thought without language 
is is a question that the philosophers are debating. And one of the things that might connect us a little bit with your teaching is you have often said to students who have grammatical challenges, write a sentence that sounds good, and it will often be grammatically correct. And I'm curious to to like that is going to that sort of language learning place. The I'm not sure. Uh, it, it probably is. Um, and how much does the habit Aiden's... of generalizing is what happens? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some people say they they have trouble. I ask, and I they. Some people say that everything in their mind is normal inside their mind. If they they can think sentences normally, but the problem is. They don't come out. They can't get them out. Other people say they have trouble thinking of words. Uh, but a, there was a book by a woman who had a stroke when she was 23 called Journey to Ithaca. And she said something very interesting in the book. She said she had trouble telling herself the stories of who she was. And she, she gradually forgot who she had been. And she actually developed a new character because she could no longer repeat those same stories in her mind to herself. Journey to that was the name of the book. It sounds question. like a therapeutic model if there ever was one. <laughs> uh, hello. Hello. Um, I had a stroke uh, two years ago, um, a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, left side, left part, posterior side. And um, uh, I... Uh, I... I I was a writer and a uh, copy editor and proofreader. All, 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 all of my life was given over to words, and uh, I lost language. Um, um, they, they, that's I'm, I'm recovering, you know. Uh, but uh, the music came first, and then words. Uh, the, the 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 one word then in my case was time, uh, time substitute substituted for everything, um, um, but uh, you it's I want to be uh, to have fun again that's one that's one that's the way that that just struck me uh i i'm 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 i i i a occasional poet but i uh, but i'm i i'm i've i'm a humor writer and it's it's that also it's 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 that's not it's not that and it's not coming back so far because because they they you know it's like it's like you 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 um it's like poetry i think the 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 humor impulse is 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 very close it's it's you know and the where whereas whereas what you, you and I were, are struggling with is you know we we have the 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 prose we have uh, I, I I I can argue uh, especially especially right. on on like writing write written down um, but I can't I can't. I can't do this. Just well, I I I really I can't do it. <laughs> um, but just keep doing it. Yes, days. and I I I so so recognize everything you're talking. Good. About. That's the first That's time. Fine. First time I've heard anybody really knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, I'm Jenny Beth Miller. I'm a licensed massage therapist, and I was actually just wondering how much you incorporated touch in your recovery and healing, because I um, see it as a very strong connection with the mind-body. Touch. Touch. 
Did you have physical the therapy? Kind of, massage. The kind of, well, I had two experiences of that kind. Um, the thing I was longing for to be able to write, as I enjoy it, was that I had to get out and walk. Uh, I used to go, I have a swimming pool in the building, and and it's, it's uh, too crowded up there right now. Kids go up, go up and play, and I, I get too much input. I like it, but I get too much input. So I, when I got walking, I found a kind of further extension of what I was thinking as I was riding, walking along. The, my brain would ride on the coasting of the motion somehow or other. Sounds crazy, but but it has rhythm to me. Um, as, as you walk, you, you pick up a repeated neurological thing that allows you to think in a in a more consecutive way. Then I have um, marvelous grandniece who has, as so many people these days, have become hyper yoga and has MS and has learned a lot of things of that kind. And she does a kind of, she's a marvelous, but she's a nurse and also a marvelous person. And she, she said, I know you're going to hate this, Aunt Marie, but uh, I think that you would like the kind of massage that I do. She's into acupuncture, God bless, and knows all the circuits and everything. And it's all laying on the hand, no, not hardly touching you. She would put one hand on one end of a circuit and, and move across the trace of the circuit. I don't even know if it's a circuit, but that's what she said it was. And she did that, and it, her arms were very warm, very hot, in fact which she was able to do. She would think herself into hot arms and hot hand. I have a, I have a complicated bad knee, which was broken when I was 21, <coughs> and the kneecap, I was hit by a car. And I had polio later on, which damaged the calf of that same left leg. And then I broke my left hip. All of these things were repaired. I could still walk. I don't limp. I like to walk. I walk miles. But I always had a pain in the knee when I was resting. And she touched my toe. I, this was a, I am not credulous in this regard. She got down to that with one arm on my on my, the small of my back, the palm, and she went down that leg to the toe, and the pain in my knee, since I was 21, had more or less of there, went away. That's fantastic. Which meant I walked better, and so it was touch. And that was my method. Yeah, I think touch, the touch has a very strong power in me. I wanted to make a comment on that, because I think that uh, the body, uh, not so much the body, but the brain uh, as reflected in the body. Uh, I agree. It's uh, what's really, we, we don't realize it, but when you produce an utterance, there are a series of sub, subsurface timing systems that come into play. Uh, for example, you have to have, at, at a very deep level, you have to pre program the res respiration for the utterance. Okay, so you have respiratory timing, or what psychologists call breath groups. That is programmed. Then the next thing is uh, programming the prosodic contour of the, of the utterance, or the intonational pattern of the utterance. And then, uh, then or with the speech melody of a particular language. If you speak French, it has one melodic structure, English another, and so on. So that's all pre-linguistic, so to say. And then out of that comes the timing of the speech sounds, a rapid timing. It's almost as if you have uh, a series of oscillators or vibratory uh, kinetic rhythms 
maybe a fundamental frequency that is uh, that develops into. So I personally think that the body aspect, the walking, as you say, uh, is it would be a very important thing to think about adding to speech therapy if patients can walk, of course. I think that's true. Yeah. I, know, I just know in my heart that that's really true. Yeah. I felt it. I have an aunt who had a stroke, and she was in a coma for three weeks. And my mother went to visit her, and she was living quite far away. And she went in to see her right from the airport, and she massaged her legs and her feet, and she talked to her the whole time for about a half an hour, and she opened her eyes and is alive. Ten, this is 10 years ago. She still has paralysis on one side of her body, but she woke up and... You know, everyone thinks my mother's a miracle worker from that, but maybe she is. I don't know. But the touch, the touch, is a great, great thing to bring up. Jackson, um, uh, if you would rewind the caucus for a second, we had a request that uh, one of Marie's poems be read. It was not uh, Marie needs no help from me to read her. Would own you poems. like to read a poem for us and, uh, before we conclude? Or two, or ten? Sure. I'll stay as long as you like. Do you have a book? <laughs> we have a book. Consider reading the cloud poem. It's kind of long. I'll try it. I'll, I'll try it fast. <laughs> this, it's not rhymed either. This bridge, like poetry, is vertigo. Dri- describing the wind that drives it. Cloud rides between earth and space. Cloud shields earth from sunscorch. Cloud bursts to cure earth's thirst. Cloud airy, wet, photogenic, is a bridge or go between. It does as it is done by. It condenses, it evaporates, it draws seas up, rains down. I do love the drift of clouds. Cloud love is irresistible, untypical, uninfinite. Deep above the linear city this morning, The cloud's soft bulk is almost unmoving. The winds it rides are thin. It makes them invisible. As sun hits it, or if sun quits us, it's blown away, or rains itself, or snows itself away. It is indefinite. This dawns on me. No cloud is measurable. Make mine cloud. Make mine cloud. The clarity of cloud is in its edgelessness, in each instant of edge, involving informal invention, always at liberty, at it, incessantly altering a lucky watcher will catch it as it makes big moves up the line of sight it lifts until it conjugates or dissipates it's identical it is identical being intact though it admits flyers it lets in wings it lets them go It lets them. It embraces mountains and spires built to be steadfast. As it goes on, it lets go of them. It is not willing. It is not unwilling. Late at night, 
when my outdoors is indoors, I picture clouds again. Come to mind, cloud. Come to cloud, mind. Thank you. Thank you.